Greetings, my family, my family. How are you today? Today with me is Dr. Edwin Nichols, and we will be looking at the topic fear during this time of global pandemic. If persons are experiencing uh, a time of fear and possible anxiety, we have our great doctor here with us. Dr. Nichols, welcome to our program today. Uh, I, I warmly welcome you to this platform. How are you? I'm well, well thank, thank you. you, and how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so very Good. kindly. Yes, yes. Could you remind our viewers of who you are and what you do? Okay, I'm uh, I'm a clinical industrial psychologist. I live in Washington, D.C. Uh, I don't practice clinical work anymore, but I do supervise uh, some clinicians that want uh, supervision on their caseload. I do do that. Uh, I work primarily, though, in organization development, which means I'm involved in helping companies be more efficient in the products they produce and uh, culturally competent staff makes that possible. But if your staff is not culturally competent, then your product isn't as good as it should be because there's too much dissension between members of your staff and they don't really produce for you as they should. So that's basically what I do. I live here in Washington, DC. I have two adult children and I have two grandchildren. I'm very happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Thank you so much. Uh, so for the next half an hour, Dr. Nichols, you're going to help us through this time of uh, pandemic where many are experiencing fear and anxiety. I open the floor to you at this point. All right, thank you. The purpose in this uh, virtual workshop is to have you examine the mental health aspects of the virus. I'm not going to take all of the aspects of it. I'm only going to take one, and I will look at that in four parts. The one that I select is the one of fear. And we will talk about fear in terms of fear of death itself, the fear of loss, the fear of conflict, and the fear of the future. Here in the United States, we have radio stations, television stations that talk conspiracy. They, for an example, talked about the fact that Trump won the election, it was stolen from him. They say that the virus is not really a virus. Uh, some will say, well, it it was man-made by China and put into this country. And there are all of these conspiracy theories that are detrimental in getting the real message out in terms of what one should do. They now are attacking the vaccines that are being produced and saying that uh, you really don't need it and there'll be herd immunity and all these different things. The reality is that when the word pan is used in a pandemic. Pan means all. So I don't care what your political suasion is, I don't care what your conspiracy theories are, the vaccine, the, the virus gets all. It's pandemic. It's all. So when that reality hits this group of people, they are disillusioned because they thought what they were hearing was crude true and correct, only to find that they now are dying of the thing they were told didn't exist, or they could have herd immunity against, or it didn't matter, it wouldn't get into their part of the city or the town. Now, the reason for that is because the first large numbers of people dying from the pandemic here in the United States were Black and Brown people primarily black African-American people were the ones who died in largest numbers. Next would have been the Hispanics. And the reason is that the conditions for health 
there's such a disparity in the health between the American white population and the black population. It has always been there that this group was always vulnerable. And very soon, when anything comes like that, it attacks and kills off the part of this group. The other part of the black population and the larger part of the Hispanic population that contracted the virus and died are people that were put into situations where they were called essential workers and had to work in spite of their feelings or their thoughts or what have you. So in the concept of the fear of death, you have two groups. The first group is the us group, and that is primarily in this country, uh, white America, and also the people that are caught up into the conspiracy. And in, they never thought that this would affect them. But as I told you, pan affects everyone. So when they began to die, they were disillusioned completely. And they were saying, well, I, why, why is this happening to me? Because I'm a very special. It should happen only to the others, those people over there. Well, it happens to both because it's pan. Now, the excuse that was given for the reason that it happened in the conspiracist thinking to African Americans and to Hispanics, well, they have high blood pressure, they have cholesterol, they have all these um, health disparities. <laughs> now, the problem is, yes, they were there, but why? Because there's always been this gap in health. So the fear of death comes as a reality. And that one of those is, will I catch the virus? Will I bring it home to my family, to my children? Will they catch it and die? And so that's a paralyzing fear, particularly when you are essential as a worker and you have to go out and work. So now let's look at the next fear, which is the fear of loss. The fear of loss is in this United States, will I lose my apartment because I can't pay the rent? Will I lose my home because I can't pay the mortgage? Will I lose my restaurant or small business because there are no clients? So those are the fears of the major population in terms of will they economically survive the whole process. That's their biggest fear. That's biggest concern. Some younger people are fear and they actually lose their apartment. And their fear is now they have to go back and live with their parents as an adult child. That's complicated because they bring their own way of behaving and try to bring it into the parents' home and the parents really don't want that kind of behavior in their house. So that creates another set of conflicts. Now, another fear of loss is I'm going to be forced to work on the job because I'm declared essential. And because I'm declared essential, I have to work. I cannot not work. So the reality on that is if I cannot work, uh, let, me get, let me just get this done. No. Um, the, the reality of that fear is I have to work. And because I have to work, now I'm in, in, the, in the fear of death. I, am I going to bring something home? But now you see, when you look at the people that were in this fear process, the fear of loss, that's that, that group of the other, those people over there. The reality is, you're putting them into situations where the, they didn't get the proper masks and covering and things that they needed. That may be a person that does housekeeping. Well, that's not the nurse and the others. They give those equipments to them. But still, you have to work as a housekeeper because you have to keep those places clean and sterilize and so on. Now, here in this country, we had the pork industry. And it was going down because so many people were con uh, contracting the virus. So they stopped working. And the government declared that they were essential workers, which forced them back to work. And the conditions under which they were has increased their number. Nobody, if you look on television, you look on YouTube, you don't know the number of, of workers that... Um, 
I'm sorry, the people just know to go from one phone to the other. There we are. Okay. Yes, it's okay. So I'm sorry. The okay. the reality is. Hello. Carl, I'm on a Zoom. Bye bye. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm very sorry. I, I okay. cut everything off and then it rings anyway. So the one phone is off, so the call on the other phone. <laughs> it's so um, if you're a, a worker in a, in a meatpacking plant, because the meatpacking industry is declared essential to the national economy, you are forced to work there whether you want to or not. And the tragedy of that was they did not give them the proper equipment to survive. And large numbers of those people contracted the virus and some of them die. So in terms of loss, not only can you lose your health, but you can lose your job. You can, if you refuse to go, you lose your job. You're forced to move out. You have nothing. So these two fears are the most common fears that African Americans and Latins have in this country. The fear of the loss of their job and the fear of death and being forced to work in conditions that were not the best for the African American or the Hispanic population in this country. Now, the third fear is the fear of not of loss, not of death, but the fear, oh, the fear of conflict. Now, what does that mean? All right. For many, African-Americans and Hispanics, we don't always live in the best housing. Many people in New York feel very happy that they got a two-bedroom project house, house in the projects for two bedrooms. Ostensibly, that's for the mother and father in one bedroom and the two children in another. They share a bedroom. Well, if you look actually into those families, there's somebody else living there in addition to that. So you'll have the grandmother and the daughter in one bedroom and the boy sleeping on a couch or on a pallet someplace else. All right. When other members of your family lose jobs because the restaurants close and what have you, they don't have a job, they're not going to go on the street. The tradition of these families are extended family and they tell you to come in. So people are sleeping on couches on every place sleeping in shifts and so on. And we have that many people that close together, we have conflict. Here's a child sitting, trying to do their homework on the kitchen table, because that's the one place where you can set up and get the electricity that you need and, and do your homework. Well, somebody else wants to eat something, somebody else is trying to cook something. And what kind of conflict do you have in these settings? In larger homes with more room, and not always with more room, you have people that will go off into one section completely by themselves. And they become absorbed in, tele in, in watching TV hour after hour after hour after hour. And that's when a lot of these people get the conspiracy theories because they're watching conspiracy, conspiracy, conspiracy. The other thing is that you have what we have online gambling. And people lose everything with online gambling. You also have gaming. A lot of people spend a lot of money playing these games, these video games that they play. All right now, those can become addictions. One of the biggest addictions to come out, and we don't talk about it, but it's pornography. People are spending hours and hours and hours watching pornography. Now, in terms of a mental health issue, what does that do? You have to remember that what you see on pornography is not um, a lovemaking experience. It's mechanical. It's for theater. And of course, if, if that's what you're supposed to accomplish, then you have people trying to uh, aspire to these kinds of behaviors. And the reality is it's not there at all. That's the disillusionment. So these are the things that people have as conflicts. Now, there's some more serious. Domestic violence is one of them that gets a lot of people into difficulty because the husband is there, the wife is there, the children are there, relatives are there, the everyone's trying to find a safe place and there isn't. 
in some of these situations, the only place that you can be safe and by yourself is the bathroom. And of course, everyone wants to go into that bathroom. Okay. So now the reality is, how then do you manage proper mental health in these environmental settings? And it says that there are times when everyone has to stop everything and have a quiet 15 minutes. That's what I found to be most successful in these places. Nothing is done. No, mom is not cooking. Nobody's working on the computer. Nobody's playing music. Nobody, no television. Nothing. Just close everything down. And for just 15 minutes, there's absolute silence. No conversation, no nothing. Just 15 minutes of silence. And that kind of brings people back to a degree of sanity. Then, of course, everything turns back on and you can go again. Some places need a couple of those. 15 minutes of sanity, maybe twice a day, sometimes three times a day. But that's one of the best ways to do that. Otherwise, there's just constant noise, distraction, and what have you. And of course, the proof that we have for that is that our children that are doing online education have dropped, some of them, almost a whole grade, at least a half a grade, uh, that they should have been forward there. Now, if this is your grade, you should be moving forward. This is your grade. You've been, you've lose, you're losing. So they're losing reality. They're not able, not, they're not even where they're supposed to have been. They've lost what they had and they're not moving forward in terms of what they should be getting. Now that's a great big problem for us here because, uh, first of all, another thing is that many of the children do not have the computers and don't have the online opportunities. And if they did, there's nobody there to supervise them or help them to do the work. So for many uh, in the African-American community and Hispanic community, our biggest fear is that our children shall have lost six to eight months of education, some a whole year. In terms of when school starts back regularly, they'll be that much behind and trying to make up, which is frightening, which is very frightening. Okay. okay. Now, the, the very last one that we want to talk about is the, the fear of the future. Here in the United States, white Americans, I'm talking about 70s, 80s, 1970s, 80s, 90s, okay? White Americans graduated from high school. That would be O-levels. Okay. They went directly into factories and they earned a good living. They could buy a house, a home, a car, and a vacation. And that was, that was labeled middle class. Now, the labeling had nothing to do with reality because if you have multi billionaires, someone making Fifty or sixty thousand dollars a year is not middle class, but we put the label on there so people would feel proud. I'm middle class. As the technology moved forward, we didn't have it. They did have it overseas. So what these factories would do is they could get more work done, cheaper, faster, better with new equipment overseas and they pulled out their companies so u.s steel bethlehem steel textiles in the south all those jobs were pulled away which meant that the people who had the high school diploma were without a job the, the changes are being made electronically the whole system is advancing the question then is what are you going to do to get a job that's the fear of the future well, the government provided programs. I need a little water here. Just excuse me for a moment. The government provided programs. They sent these programs in to work with these men who had lost their jobs. Well, they took the course for a week. They dropped out. They complained about the course. They just did not take it. So all of that government investment was lost because the people did not do what they were supposed to do. 
And you ask yourself, well, why didn't they do what they were supposed to do? The problem was, when you look at the transcript from their high school, they had never had algebra, yet they had O-levels. How could you have O-levels and not even have had algebra? The, lar the most extensive math class that they had had was general math, which is just addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So they did not have the basic educational skills to take advantage of the opportunities that the government was offering them. That group became very disgruntled, very, very disgruntled, very angry. And they were susceptible to the politicalization of make America great again. That phrase is what we call a dog whistle. You know, they're whistles that you can blow and the dog can hear it, but other people can't hear it. So the idea is that blowing that whistle when it says make America great again, the reality is they were saying, give us our white privilege back. Make America white again. That was the dog whistle. Okay. They voted, they won, but nothing happened. That group of people is still without work. Now, there's something else that we really need to talk about, and that is the reality of what is the future in terms of work. Because of globalization, if we're going to be competitive, we have to move from the old vertical and hierarchical organizational structure that just went up. So if, if I'm here and you are here and you're my friend, every time I move up, I'll pull you up. And you're always loyal to me because when you move up, I'll, when I move up, you'll move up. Well, that system collapsed in the 70s and 80s. The new system now is that everyone works on a team. A team says, we have a product that we have to produce in X amount of days or weeks. And we need five different skill sets on that team to make it work. The literature, the scientific literature tells us that homogeneous teams, all white males, are not efficient as compared to heterogeneous teams, which are women, different ethnic groups, different religions, everything working all together on a team. They are more creative and more productive. Now, that's just fact. And the person who wrote the the beginning of that study was um, Scott Page, and he wrote a book called The Difference out of the University of Michigan. Now, that's been established because he wrote it a long time ago, and that's the reality now. Now, the people who run the large firms know that they're going to have to bring some jobs back to the United States because this pandemic has shown us that there are vital interests and vital industries that we need to have here. But now, when they bring those back, who's going to be the workforce? If you don't have the math skills, you don't have the other training. So um, what I'm sharing with your audience is maybe they don't go to college, but they can go to the community college and get a certificate for a specific skill and get a job. See, it used to be you had to do four years of college and you would that would, but the expense is too great now. So for people that couldn't afford to go to college or can't afford to go to college, you go and get these certificates. And the certificate says you are qualified to do the work that this new factory is bringing in. Electronic things that you have to do. You get the job. Others will be out there waiting. Now, that's going to create mental health problems for people that feel they're not bright enough to learn the new technology. Or they feel that uh, they don't want to learn it. And that's going to create a new class in this country of uh, people that before saw themselves as middle class, they are now going to be lower class. And the skills level with an O level in this country now is service industry. And that means cleaning pots and pans and waiting and working in hospitals and things like that. It's, it's, that's what the O level will get in this country now, just service jobs. Now for people who thought themselves too good to do those things, but not having the top skills that are necessary, they're going to be in a lot of trouble. And of course, they will foment discord. They will think there are conspiracies and things are happening. And we're going to have more 
of the January 6th thing that we had here in the United States. It won't be directed at our capital, but it'll be directed at different ones. We already had an attack on the capital in Michigan, Lansing, Michigan. So what I'm sharing with you is that there's going to be turmoil and we have to be cognizant of these turmoils because people fear what is the future bringing? What does the future hold for me? And what I say to people is find out what the new industries are that are coming into your area and get the skill, which is a certificate of a six week or, or two month certificate of training. Sometimes it's a week training. And once you know that and you have that certificate, then you will get the job. For those that are going to university, then some of the STEM classes that they talk about in high school or college, those are the most essential jobs for the future, for the 21st century. Um, the jobs that we used to have, uh, physical labor and so forth, they have machines that can do it faster, better, and what have you. Now, let me give you another example. We have here Amazon. Amazon, you can call and they'll get your package to you tomorrow. And a lot of that work is done by robots. But what is the biggest complaint that you have from the people that are working there? Human beings are not robots and they can't keep the pace. See, the robot can work lunch, dinner, breakfast, just keeps working. But human beings have to take a, a rest, a toilet break, something, and they can't physically keep up with what's going on. And you have all kinds of muscle strain, neck strain, back strain, things thrown out of line, and so forth. And that's what the union uh, was trying to uh, get into the union in the, in the southern state of Bessemer, Alabama, with their big company. So the main thing that I want to share with your group, it's time for us to close practically, is that there's the fear of death, and that is omnipresent, and it's also asking, will I kill members of my own family because I'm an essential worker and have to go out. There's the fear of loss. Will I lose my home? Will I be homeless? Will I lose my apartment? What will I lose? My job, my future, what's going on? That's a great fear. The other fear is conflict within the house. Are we going to have abuse, domestic violence? Are we going to have people escaping into fantasies or what have you? And then sometimes you have people that snap. They just have a mental health crisis. So one must be observant in that family household to see if someone's isolating too much or, or kind of drifting off. And some start to self-medicate, you know, just a little uh, something to drink or smoke. That's self-medication. And of course, that doesn't work because you don't have enough money to keep buying that expense, paying for that expense. And then the last one, of course, is the fear of the future. And that is the most important thing that I can share with your audience today, is that, that the world has changed. And you will work on a team, on a project. When the team finishes the task, it breaks up. And new teams will be formed. And your question is, will I have the skill to get a job on the newest team? So you must have the most current skills and keep them current and updated so that when the job is offered, you will have the skill, the certificate, the paper to start to work in that place at that time. Thank you very much. That's wonderful, Dr. Nichols. Thank you so much for sharing uh, so much knowledge, food for thought for all of us uh, during this time. Yes. I, I hear you saying that we need from time to time, we might need some time out just to be silent and uh, doing some deep reflection. I, I think uh, thinking about uh, our, our own selves in a way, uh, for example, uh, working on ourselves physically, mentally, and um, educationally. Am I hearing you saying that? so that we can be current and we can prepare for the future as well. Yes, exactly. Exactly that. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, yes. I thank you. It, yeah. You're very welcome. In that you uh, talk, uh, you're a rep you are a reverend and you're, you're, you have church service and so on. 
Yes. Some families have an hour that they read the Bible or 15 minutes. A quiet time is just to read. I know Catholic families do the rosary for about 15 minutes during a rosary. And that's kind of a time out because it's kind of reflection time and kind of a rest time. So for those people that have a religious tradition, then that's a time to practice something as a collective, not just go off by yourself, but gather together and have it as a gathering. Thank you again for inviting me. I, it's always a pleasure to work with you. Yes, thank you so much. It's an honor having you with us. And I'm sure that we have been uh, blessed by what you had to share with us. Thank you again. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye. <laughs> yes, my sisters and brothers, there we have it. Uh, if you're experiencing fear in one way or another, those are good nuggets and tips for you to adhere to and follow up on so that you can be helped in this time. So until next time, take care, God bless you, and one love.